So I've been using the XMG Core 17 right here for about three weeks now, and I think that I'm finally ready to give you guys an idea about its performance and also talk about some of its shortcomings. But before we're going to get into all of that, I'd like to mention that this right here is not a final review unit, since at the time when I requested this laptop from XMG, they told me that not even they had a final review unit on hand, which means that the results that you're seeing might be a little bit worse than what you might be getting out of your final laptop that you might be getting if you decide to go with this one and with regards to that uh, I can tell you that at the moment you can only get the Ryzen 4800H plus RTX 3060 combination from their website and I will have links to that in the video description of course whereas in here I happen to have the Ryzen 5800H plus RTX 3060 combo and the RTX 3060, if you would like to know, has 115 watts available to it, plus 15 watts of dynamic boost, which of course is going to ensure that you're going to get just that extra bit of performance whenever you'll be gaming or doing any of your other tasks. So I promise that we will get into benchmarks first, but I would like to tell you uh, a few things that um, <laughs> are really important um, to me as a reviewer, and that is going to be that, of course, you're going to have um, timestamps all across this video, so if you want to skip to the benchmarks, you can do it right now. But there are also other things that I will be talking about, such as how I tested this laptop, and I should also probably remind you that this is not a sponsored uh, video by XMG. They have only given me this laptop to review it, and I only get to keep it till um, April, and if you happen to have any other questions after you're done watching this video, or would like to see any other uh, video, so if you have suggestions, uh, for what I could be able to do until uh, April comes around, then uh, write me some comments right there and I might be able to do that. And another thing that I would like to point out is that I've also unboxed and given you my first impressions about this laptop and you're going to be able to see that video right over here. Now, going on to the methodology, I should probably tell you how I tested this laptop and that has been really easy. I just went into Control Center and um, maxed or cranked all of the dials and got 80 watts out of the CPU and 130 watts out of the GPU and of course those are in um, the best case scenarios because you're not always going to get that out of these components obviously and you also should probably know that I turned on fan boost uh, for all of my tests just to give you an idea of what the best worst case scenario would look like because obviously running these components at their max is going to mean that you're going to get more heat because remember or remember <laughs> more watts means more heat so that's about it of how I tested everything another thing that I could probably mention is that the Ryzen 5000 CPUs have finally made it to laptops as well and I guess that's on paper at least because uh, these uh, CPUs are still relatively difficult to um, get a hold of and uh, the improvements that they've made to the uh, L3 cache so they doubled the L3 cache they um, got some serious IPC improvements and they made a lot of changes to the um, to how the CPU works in uh, general and I'm going to have more information about that in the video description where of course you will also find a lot more information about not only this laptop but about um, other things that I've noticed when testing this uh, laptop and some other uh, benchmarks from other fellow content creators like Jared's Tech, Hardware Unbox and also from some websites that I really enjoy reading those being of course Notebook Check and TechSpot and and a lot of other people that uh, I've been following in on YouTube before making this review and of course also in general and I really think that you guys should check them out and you're probably going to hear me mentioning their uh, their names uh, quite a few, yeah quite a few times around uh, in this video but now I think I bored you enough with that so let's get into the benchmarks Starting off with Cinebench R20, in single core, the 5800H managed to score 543 points, whereas in multi core, it reached 4,884 points. All things considered, those are some good results and very similar to what Jared was able to get with his model, but of course, he had to have a golden sample, which obviously would put it ahead of the one that I had right here. 
Cinebench R23 was next, and in here I've noticed that the Ryzen 5800H was able to pull about 1,403 points in single core and 12,284 points in multi core. Again, this is nothing to scoff at, especially since these results are similar to what a desktop 3700X would be able to get. CPU Z had the CPU scoring 556 points in single core and 5,759 points in multi core, which would put it rather close to the desktop 9900K. In Passmark's CPU test, the overall score was 5,688, whereas the CPU score was 23,736. And I would call that not too shabby, since this would again put it very close to the desktop 3700X. 7-Zip was next, where the built-in benchmark showed that the Ryzen CPU was able to reach 60,158 MIPS for compression and 95,265 MIPS for decompression. Results for compression are a bit lower than what Jared got on his 5800H, but that might be to the inferior RAM configuration on my system and his system of course having that golden CPU I mentioned previously. DaVinci Resolve was tested on version 16.3 using Puget Systems benchmark and here the Ryzen 5800H managed to score 827 points. Now a more detailed look will be provided in the written document in the description but all in all in my eyes this is a great result for a small machine like this one. And well I guess small is relative here. However, video editor is on the go, you might actually like this one. Handbrake was tested using the same method that PCMag uses for all of their laptop reviews and this means using the open source 4K video Tears of Steel in order to encode it using 1080p fast preset. Using the H.264 profile, the encoding was done in 6 minutes and 34 seconds. And just out of curiosity, I've tested the NVENC GPU encoder and that one managed to finish it in 5 minutes and 1 second. FryRender essentially did a speedrun at 1 minute and 49 seconds, and the Corona Benchmark 1.3 also put the Ryzen ahead with its 1 minute and 45 seconds time to completion, with about 4.5 million rays on average. Blender was tested using the BMW and Classroom benchmarks on version 2.91.2, and the results look as follows. In Classroom, the CPU managed to complete the scene in 9 minutes on average, whereas in the BMW scene, it took it about 3 minutes and 26 seconds on average. So, even if you were to grab, to grab this laptop with this CPU or a more power-efficient U version and no GPU, you'd still be able to do a lot of work with it, but hopefully you'll also have access to decent cooling and a charger, because it will definitely sip through power. But I guess the 5900HS would also deliver similar performance, so perhaps check out what Jared or Steven from Owner Disown had to say about that. Geekbench saw the CPU hit on average 1,462 points in single core and 8,153 points in multi core scenarios. Again, a more detailed look will be provided in the description since I've kept all of the links to the benchmarks I've conducted. PC Mark 10 was also used to benchmark the CPU, and here I've tested the three versions available in the advanced version since the other ones cost about 1500 US dollars, and of course yours truly can't afford that when the ad revenue sits much rather at 1.5 US dollars per video. In the Essentials benchmark, the CPU scored 7078 points, whereas in the Express version, I saw a score of 5665 points, and last but not least, in the Extended benchmark, I saw a score of 8697 points. And I know that the order should have been 213, but still, you can see that this laptop will be able to chew through most of the office and gaming tasks that you would be throwing at it, which is also what I've experienced when putting it through its paces. I also haven't tested the iGPU of this laptop in gaming since I wasn't really sure how many of you would be interested in seeing that, so if you would like to see a video like that being done on this channel, then let me know in the comments. Otherwise, if you are really eager to see those things, then I'd highly recommend you check out Jared's channel because he has some videos regarding it, or um, Tech Epiphany because he has done a lot of those videos looking at how the iGPU performs on the newly released Ryzen 5000 CPUs, or I guess you could also 
call them APUs. And if you are really interested in seeing how all of those things perform in those PC portable switch platforms, then I'm going to have some videos about that in the description of this video as well, because trust me, those things have become really popular. I would really like to get one of those things myself, but I don't know when that is going to be uh, happening. Either way, another thing that I would like to mention before we're going to get into the benchmarks for the RTX 3060 is that if you'd like to see even more um, apps being tested with this CPU that I'm going to have in the video description an article from TechSpot where they have covered the things like uh, Photoshop, Excel and many of the other things that I either wasn't able to test with uh, this laptop or that I didn't buy because I didn't really see a point in buying, you know. Either way, going to the RTX uh, 3060 benchmarks, I would just like to point out that if you have skipped the introduction, this is the 115 watts version plus 15 watts for a total of 130, but most of the time I've seen about 123 to 125 watts, and obviously that is going to depend on a game-by-game -game basis, so uh, let's just start looking at those results, shall we? Starting off with the synthetic benchmarks, in V-Ray the GPU managed to score 9008 points or raise, whereas in the CUDA benchmark it scored 757 points. In Blender the classroom scene got rendered in 2 minutes and 24 seconds, whereas the BMW scene took 44 seconds to complete. And to me, those are some pretty compelling results given that for most creators, shaving off any extra seconds means that you get to work on other projects which could of course bring you some more money. And maybe I should learn that myself. Geekbench was tested with the CUDA, OpenCL and Vulkan benchmarks right here and the results are as follows. 106,629 in the CUDA benchmark, 103,145 in the OpenCL benchmark, and 78,788 in the Vulcan benchmark. Moving on to Heaven, I've tested this at 1080p with everything maxed out, and there I've seen 200 FPS on average and a score of 5,030 points. In superposition, using the extreme profile, I got about 39 FPS on average and 5,264 points. But change that to high and I got 86 FPS on average and 11,522 points. And with these first synthetic benchmarks, I started getting an idea of how good the RTX 3060 Mobile really is. And it definitely has some grit because its performance is very similar to that of the RTX 2060 Super, which in essence would put it closer to the RTX 3060 since that GPU is not really the same. Sure, they have the same G106 die, but they have different specs otherwise, and you're going to see that on screen right now. But you also probably remember these other videos that I've made talking about NVIDIA and how they made everything so much more confusing this year. So let's also move on to 3D Mark before we're going to get into the gaming benchmarks. In TimeSpy's main benchmark, the GPU managed to score 8,856 points, which I'm happy to say is more than the average. Compared to the RTX 3070 on an XMG Neo as an example, this would be roughly 1800 points less. And no, I don't think that it's going to outpace it anytime soon, but given that this laptop and this GPU might eventually get cheaper, well, at least that is going to be a good entry point for gamers on a budget. And I've also tested TimeSpy's Firestrike with all of its profiles, Standard, Extreme and Ultra, and in Standard, which is essentially 1080p, I managed to reach a score of 19,608 points, which so far was the highest score for this GPU. With the Extreme preset, the results dropped down to 9,947 points, but this score was again higher than the average. In Ultra, the results I got put it at 5,331 points, and you can learn more about the individual results in the links in the video description. In Port Royal, the GPU managed to score 5,076 points, which would put it ahead of the 2080 Super Max-Q GPUs like the ones found on the MSI Creator 17 as an example. Now let's move on to the games where I've tested over 20 titles that I think most people would play on this machine and yes I did just have to buy some of those just for these benchmarks alone so thumbs up for careless investments and a larger back catalog to catch up to and also feel free to check out the description for more information about all of this. 
Assassin's Creed Valhalla was tested using the in-game benchmark and the results showed 63 FPS average and 39 FPS for the 1% lows when testing with the ultra high preset which is definitely playable, but I personally use the hardware unboxed optimized settings to get an extra 20 to 25% boost in performance. I personally also recommend all of their guides for all of their AAA titles, so make sure that you check out their playlist in the video description if you are interested. But for now, these will be the best worst case scenario benchmarks if that makes sense. But as fun as that might sound, this will also show you what the CPU and the GPU can each do, something that Bob from Bubble World Trades has also explained on his new channel called Tested, so do make sure to check that out as well. Red Dead Redemption 2 was also tested with the highest options and the in-game benchmark and the results got me an average of 52 FPS. Playing with the settings, however, you can get to 76 FPS average and 41 FPS 1% lows. Horizon Zero Dawn was tested with the highest preset and motion blur off, resulting in 86 FPS average and 63 FPS 1% lows. And this, in my opinion, is a pleasant gaming experience, which is at least two times better than playing it at 30 FPS like I did when I first played it on PS4. And please, press F to pay your respects right now. Borderlands 3 was tested with a badass preset, which managed to score 71 FPS on average and 50 FPS 1% lows. And whilst this is not the best, you can obviously make some changes and put it down to the highest preset and then you'll be able to get 76 FPS on average and 62 FPS 1% lows, which means that you'll be able to get a smoother in-game experience. But given that this is a looter shooter, I'd much rather play it around with the settings to get an average of 105 FPS and some nice 69 FPS 1% lows. Nice. Shadow of the Tomb Raider saw an average of 60 FPS with the ultra preset and ray tracing enabled, but that can go up to 97 FPS if it's disabled. With depth of field and level of detail set to normal, you can expect about 102 FPS on average. Here, due to the nature of the benchmark, I couldn't really give you the 1% lows, but you can expect a playable experience at all of those settings. But I'll also personally go with the second one. Another in-game benchmark that I'm not a big fan of is that from Metro Exodus, so I decided to test a similar scene to that from Hardware Unboxed, and with the Extreme preset, this GPU managed to speed out 83 FPS on average, with 67 FPS 1% lows. Turn on ray tracing and DLSS and you'll be going to about 63 FPS average and 46 FPS 1% lows. But chances are you'll find a lot of areas where the game will eventually run smoother so I wouldn't really worry about its performance. To me, everything felt rather good. Some of you also warned me about Watch Dog Legions and their benchmark, and yes, this was quite a weird one, but here I'd like to point out that with everything cranked, you will be going over the 6GB of VRAM that this GPU has available to it, so your performance will take a hit. With the ultra preset, ray tracing off, and DLSS performance, I saw an average of 64 FPS with 34 FPS 1% lows, which isn't perfect, but it might be playable for some. CSGO was tested using the Uletical benchmark and the results showed 350 FPS on average, which is obviously more than you're going to need for such a game and obviously more than this screen can actually output, so no complaints here. But definitely don't forget to turn off the iGPU like I did. And if you'd like to learn more why, then check out this video from Brandon from Gizmo Sliptech. In Rainbow Six Siege, using the in-game benchmark, the laptop managed to pump 278 FPS on average with 224 FPS 1% lows, which will ensure you'll get an incredibly smooth experience. You'll also get a very smooth experience playing GTA 5, even when you're going to have all the settings maxed out, because with 134 FPS on average and 91 FPS 1% lows, I think that most of you guys are going to be happy. Apex Legends is also a game that I enjoy playing from time to time and this laptop didn't let me down because even with the settings cranked I saw an average of 135 FPS during an entire game so I can't really complain. With competitive settings you'll surely get to the advantage of the 144Hz refresh rate of this panel so if you're the kind of person that wants to play with competitive settings please be my guest and do that. Ghost Runner is an indie game that still requires some power at the highest settings, but this laptop managed to reach 136 FPS on average with 87 FPS 1% lows, so even when you'll be hacking and slashing and moving quickly around the area, you won't be bothered by anything other than your poor in-game decisions. 
Witcher 3 is already getting old, like Jared likes to say, but this game can still look absolutely gorgeous with a 4K textures mod, and this is how I tested the game myself. I've gotten on average 115 FPS with 109 FPS 1% lows when galloping outside of Novigrad and into the city, which is by all means an enjoyable experience. Another CD Projekt Red title, which you might have heard about, is Cyberpunk, and here I've tested the game with the save game files from PCG Hardware in Kabuki. I haven't tested this game with the performance tweaks covered in this video or any of the other performance enhancements tools, but you can obviously expect higher frames if you do decide to go with them, minus some visual quality of course. With ultra settings however, ray tracing off and DLSS off, we're seeing 55 FPS on average and 45 FPS 1% lows. But lower that to high settings, ray tracing off and DLSS balanced and you'll be jumping to 84 FPS average and 61 FPS 1% lows, which is definitely playable. That is, of course, unless you're going to encounter some major in-game bugs, right? If you prefer ultra settings, ray tracing off, DLSS balanced, you can expect about 76 FPS on average. And with the ray tracing ultra, DLSS quality, you won't be getting close to 60 FPS, but much, much rather to 48 FPS on average, but with some stable 40 FPS 1% lows, so definitely still playable. But I'd argue that making a few the small changes, which will not really impact visual quality, and then you'll be able to easily get a smooth 60 FPS experience out of this game, even with ray tracing enabled. Here, I could also recommend the video that Gamers Nexus has done on the topic, and that one is obviously going to be linked in the video description. But if you thought Cyberpunk was a new Crisis, then don't forget that Crisis Remastered also exists, and I have tested this laptop using their Can It Run Crisis preset, and I'm glad to say that this laptop got an average of 40 FPS with 31 FPS 1% lows, so definitely a tiny bit better than what a beefier PC in 2007 or 2008 would be able to do. But whether I'd play this or go down to very high, or play around with the settings just a little bit, or deactivate ray tracing to get 76 fps on average i don't really know but 40 fps definitely gives me some nostalgia i will also be showing you some results with dlss but i believe i'm going to have more things about that in the video description control was tested with the highest settings running around and fighting with the hiss or whatever they call them because spoiler alert i haven't really played that game that much and with motion blur, ray tracing and DLSS all turned off, I saw an average of 72 FPS, which is arguably a good frame rate for this game. But that means you'll be missing out on ray tracing, but given that with ray tracing high and DLSS off, you're going to get yourself 44 FPS on average, well, I wouldn't really do that. But what I would do instead is to turn on DLSS 2.0 and get an average of 64 FPS, which is definitely very playable. And by the way, DLSS 2.0 might be coming to more games in the future, so be excited for that. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then make sure you check out this other video that I've done. Again, play around with the settings if you want a superior performance, and I don't mean that in a cunning way, but rather be happy that this is possible on this machine. Battlefield 5 was also tested with multiple settings options, and at its core, with the only ultra preset enabled, I got an average of 108 FPS in the French campaign map, and obviously you can expect varying results in multiplayer, perhaps 10 to 20% less. With DXR set to Ultra and DLSS turned on, I managed to score 71 FPS on average, but lowering DXR got me up to 82 FPS and more stable 1% lows. But lower those settings to the high preset and you'll get yourself 121 FPS on average with the XR and DLSS turned off, which is arguably the better experience on this panel and obviously in such a shooter. If you're more of a Call of Duty fan, however, then I've tested Modern Warfare and Warzone since I couldn't really afford Core War after buying Valhalla and Legion. But we're not here to discuss my financial status or poor financial decisions in general, so let me instead tell you that in Warzone, I saw an average of 108 FPS in the games I've played, but this will of course vary a lot based on where you drop and what you do within the game. I didn't test the ray tracing in Warzone since I don't really think that makes any sense, but in multiplayer I got an average of 93 FPS with ray tracing enabled and without it about 113 FPS. Whether that makes sense to you, I'll let you decide. 
but fortunately there are games which support the replay feature such as PUBG and Fortnite, but let's start with PUBG for now. Because there with the Ultra preset on the Sandhawk map I got an average of 128 FPS, but changing the preset to high got me to 135 FPS, so very close to the monitor's refresh rate. But given that you'll be playing this game with competitive settings, I'd expect you'll be easily maxing out the refresh rate. Fortnite was also tested with a replay feature, but can I take a moment to brag about getting three wins back to back? Because I never played Fortnite and I thought that this game was incredibly easy after playing it. I have to tell you that this game is also pretty easy to run on this machine, even at their epic settings, but not when it comes down to ray tracing, because that thing will obviously take this laptop down to its knees. So with ray tracing on and DLSS turned off, I got an average of 24 FPS which is literally unplayable, but with DLSS performance you can get yourself up to 64 FPS, which is still not what you want out of a competitive title in my opinion, but with ray tracing turned off and DLSS performance turned on, I got it to 160 FPS on average, which is still better than the 136 FPS on the epic settings with no ray tracing and no DLSS. Obviously, with competitive settings, you'll be getting way better frames, so definitely no worries over here. But also, please make me a promise that you will not be buying this laptop just to play Fortnite on it, okay? Perhaps try out some Doom Eternal at least, which also runs great on this machine, but I have to warn you that with the Ultra Nightmare preset, you'll be also going over the 6GB of VRAM, just like you can do it in uh, Watch Dogs Legion. So what I did here was to reduce the texture pool to Nightmare instead of Ultra Nightmare, which got me to an average of 120 FPS. With the Nightmare preset enabled, that went up to 132 FPS and on Ultra, which still looks great by the way, that one netted me around 156 FPS. The Division 2 was tested with an DirectX 11 and DirectX 12, and here I saw a difference of up to 15% between the two APIs, so I'd recommend using DX12. Using the in-game benchmark and the Ultra preset, I saw an average of about 95 FPS and 1% lows sitting comfortably at 70, which is far better than on DX11. I've also tested Ghost Recon Breakpoint with the DirectX and the Vulkan API and noticed about a 10% difference between the two, so here I'd recommend using Vulkan. Testing with the in-game benchmark with the Ultra preset, I got close to 100 FPS on average with 61 FPS 1% lows. Valorant saw an average of 198 FPS, with 1% lows sitting comfortably at around 142 FPS, so even at the high settings, you'll be maxing out this screen's refresh rate. And with the iGPU, you'll be losing about 10% FPS from what I was able to find out whenever I turned that on as well. All in all, I'm really pleased with the CPU and the GPU, and I still think that 1080p is going to be the sweet spot resolution for it, because XMG is also going to be offering this laptop in a 1440p version, but I don't really think that it's going to make a lot of sense for you. Of course, you're going to see that um, your GPU is going to be more saturated whenever you're going to be using a 1440p panel, but I don't think that the trade-off is really worth it. And by the trade-off, I mean that you're of course going to get fewer frames in the games that you will be playing this at. Still, if you're someone who really wants to use this for only casual games or competitive games, then I think 1440p might still make sense for you. I've also taken the time to benchmark the 5 500 gigabyte Samsung 970 EVO Plus inside of this laptop to show just how fast this speedy boy can really get, but you're most probably going to have to buy yourself a second SSD or an external one, much like I did, in order to expand your storage and be able to fit more than two Call of Duty games and Windows, because uh, those things are obviously really massive. But if you're really frugal with your data, I guess that's also going to be fine for you. I know that there are people out there with 250 or 500 that are, aren't really bothered, but that's beside the point right now. I would just like to show you on screen the results from Crystal Diskmark, where you can see that um, the reads and write speeds were hovering in the neighborhood of 3500 megabytes and 3200 megabytes respectively. And in AS SSD, we've seen some similarly great results. And since I've also taken the time to use an external SSD via the laptop's Type-C connector, I can tell you that 
it didn't get bottlenecked. Obviously, we're still using Type-C right here, so I didn't have any issues. I still got the 500 megabytes that my Crucial X6, X6 could offer, sorry for that. But obviously, you will be able to, like I said, get a even better speeds out of something like an SSD that is a lot more powerful because Type-C has all of that bandwidth available for you. Now, I sadly cannot say the same good things about the battery because we're still dealing with a gaming laptop right here and you know how it is most of the time they're really bad and the XMG Core 17 right here is no exception because with its puny 64 watt hour battery, I wasn't really able to get a lot of uh, usage out of it. But I would also like to say that most people buying this laptop are most likely going to buy it and use it as their battle station and not really move it around so I don't think it's going to be a problem if you are someone who is indeed going to use it docked at home you know as a desktop replacement and trust me there are a lot of people who will be using this as a desktop replacement given that right now it's really not that easy to get a hold of a uh, desktop PC you know GPUs, CPUs all of those uh, things are really not available but that's enough talking let's look at the results Using LifeMode to test the battery, the laptop managed to fully deplete its battery in 2 hours and 49 minutes, but testing with YouTube, playing some videos and listening to chill beats, the battery took about 2 hours and 11 minutes before it went into hibernation mode at 5%. Playing Witcher 3 on this integrated graphics at 720p with the battery saver profile activated gave me about 30 FPS on average and a battery life of an hour and 30 minutes. And on rare occasions I also got 3 hours out of it but those weren't the usual conditions you'd see me using a laptop in so um, I guess don't really look at that. Looking at the results for this puny 64 watt hour battery also made me want to reiterate that this is not going to be a laptop that you will be carrying around with you uh, to school or work unless you are going to be able to plug it in over there, which I guess would also be fine. But if you're going to forget your charger, don't expect to be able to be using this for an entire uh, day at school or work, which would be seven or eight hours. But again, I'm mostly aware that people buying this kind of a laptop would be using it as a desktop replacement. But do keep in mind that whenever you're going to be using this laptop, say in six or 12 months, um, you're not even going to be able to get to those two and a half hours that I got right now since that's pretty much how batteries work. So your best bet right here would be to much rather go with something like a 99.9 .9, uh, watt hour battery. And um, you're sadly not going to get this out of uh, any of the models that um, XMG is selling for the um, Core 17, or at least not to my knowledge. Um, I was mostly referring to other laptops from MSI and ASUS, but I'm not really sure about ASUS. I'm sure that MSI does indeed sell some laptops with really big batteries. Now that we've seen all of those benchmarks, let's also talk about the laptop in a more general sense. And I can tell you that the plastic and aluminum construction, even on this early sample unit, felt rather sturdy. You can notice some keyboard flex if you really push the keys, but that's something that you will not really be noticing when gaming on typing on the keyboard. And speaking of the keyboard, my experience got marginally better a week after I first used it, but it's still not something I'd switch to and I will get back to that a little bit later. Now the hinge mechanism felt a bit flimsier at times, but I've been made well aware of that by XMG before receiving this laptop, so I won't be taking any points off of their uh, laptop right here. And you also won't be able to tilt the screen all the way back like you would be able to do on some Lenovo laptops but I'd say that the maximum angle it can reach is still more than you'll ever need on such a device given that you don't have touch support. Speaking of that, unless you'll be touching or bumping your screen, you won't be noticing any wobble, but do that and then you'll actually end up with a dangly mess. Still, I really like the panel that they have used uh, on this monitor, and this is of course the BOE0823, about which you can learn more from the links in the video description because right now I wasn't really able to find more information about it. Now sadly, I don't have all of the right tools to test everything that you might want to see in a monitor, like response rates, delta E values, and all of that good stuff but what I can do is go all non-scientific again and tell you that everything felt buttery smooth to me from browsing the web very casually, watching YouTube videos, Netflix movies or series and also gaming and 
I've even played Watch Dogs Legions at 45 to 50 FPS, and I have to admit that even that felt uh, smooth, but obviously uh, you have to know that this was also because, or thanks to the frame times that I got all of those things, not only uh, thanks to the monitor, but what I can tell you is that the GPU was able to output all of those frames and get to the frame times that felt everything feel really smooth and you might be actually asking yourself right now at what cost well there have certainly been times where i've noticed the cpu hitting 96 degrees celsius and 82 degrees celsius for the gpu which all things considered are things that got me really worried that I might be losing out on performance or that I might be burning my hands somehow. But with the CPU at 96 degrees Celsius and the GPU at 80C, like I said previously, using Apex Legends and Ida64 for 20 minutes, I still did not get bothered by the heat output. Now, I'm not here to tell you that 96 degrees Celsius for the CPU is fine or that it's not really hot. I can only tell you that it didn't bother me because I'm well aware that all of those things like the CPU and the GPU won't really get damaged that easily. Of course, if you're going to get a lot of dirt and you're not going to change the paste and all of that stuff, uh, your performance might very well suffer. But in the grand scheme of things, I was really fine with it as, as it was. And I can tell you that the GPU was um, sitting most of the time at about 120 watts and the CPU was able to boost itself to 3.7 gigahertz. Now, I might have more information in the video description, so make sure you check it out. Of course, you're not going to see um, those temperatures whenever you're going to be playing um, other games or whenever you're going to be keeping your CPU at a lower wattage and the same can be said about the GPU. Still, I believe that this was um, worth pointing out in this one. Another thing that I would like to point out is that XMG told me that in this unit that they sent me, they had some problems with the cooling, so this might not actually be uh, what you're going to be experiencing with your own laptop that you're going to be getting. But of course, I have to tell you about the results that I got myself. I would also like to tell you that Again, you should really take care of any of the devices that you're using, but especially the laptops. So make sure you clean out uh, the vents and everything else and also repaste the laptop if you can. Otherwise, ask a professional to do it or just go on YouTube and uh, look out for Bob from Bob of All Trades because he has done a lot of useful videos showing you that. Another thing to consider is that, M uh, that uh, XMG is also selling quite a few of their laptops with Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut paste and they have a plethora of options options for you guys to choose from and uh, that doesn't really make me worried that your final unit or anything else that you'll be buying from them is going to be problematic. Plus the last thing that I could mention about this is that I know that I'm the reviewer in this case and not the customer uh, but my discussions with them have been really nice and that makes me think that their customer service is going to help you if you're going to have any problems but of course I cannot make any promises with regards to that. Now I'm not a fortune teller and I can't really promise that XMG will indeed make all of those changes that they said to get those temperatures lower but what I can tell you is that some people are going to buy this laptop and whenever they're going to get their hands on them they're most likely going to go on Reddit or some other communities and tell people about the temperature temperatures that they've seen on the CPU and the GPU and if you think that they are indeed the same that you've seen right here then you can probably go to XMG and tell them like hey why didn't you fix this didn't you promise that you have and another thing to consider is that these um, um, components like both of those chips for the CPU and the GPU they are made to run at these temperatures comfortably or at least that's what I was able to find out when looking at the um, temperature juncture so TJ Maxx and all of that stuff but still if XMG is not going to make all of those changes I guess they're going to get themselves a lot of heat and speaking of heat there is another thing to consider with regards to that and uh, that is how hot the keyboard and the chassis in general got and with regards to that I can tell you that the WASP and the numpad keys were relatively cool like I had no issues with it but whenever it came down to the F keys to or the F key all the way to 
to the enter key. That section was pretty much a hotspot and the same can be said about the uh, section where you have the power button and the uh, profile switcher between the different profiles that you have in control center. Like that bar got really, really hot. So I would really advise you against touching it whenever you're going to be using it. But I also don't think that you're going to have much use for it other than, you know, turning on your laptop or turning it off or also switching between profiles. Now, another thing to consider is that the area to the left of the touchpad where you're going to have your wrist, that one also felt relatively cool, so you're not going to have any issues with it. However, the, ex the area to the right of it, so right under the numpad, that one felt a little bit warm-ish to the touch. But to prove that um, I don't need all of the fancy equipment, I'm going to show you now a screenshot from Notebook Check where they used a um, uh, thermal imaging camera, I guess, or a flare camera, whatever the heck it is called. Uh, and you can see uh, the exact temperatures just to get a better idea of what you can expect from this laptop. And another thing to probably talk about right now is going to be how the trackpad felt. And I can't really say like that many good things about it because yeah, it's just a normal uh, glass touchpad and it's not all that big. I kind of discussed about it in the other video that I posted about this laptop. You will probably have to, you know, make use of it, but yeah, not, not, not really much about it. And I'm also not someone who is going to use a touchpad most of the time. Still, if you are going to want to use it for Excel, I would really recommend you get yourself an external mouse and also an external keyboard because that is most likely uh, going to make things a lot easier for you. But you know, you do you. Now, um, with regards to the keyboard, I would also like to mention that I would have preferred to have uh, mechanical switches on this one, like we have on some other XMG laptops. And I also would have preferred to have a QWERTY layout, but obviously here in Germany, you get QWERTS and that most likely won't be an issue uh, for you if you've been using that for over 20 years. Like I've been using QWERTY and keyboards in general. and. With regards to that, I got uh, used to it, obviously, really quickly. So I don't think that if you are an experienced typer, you're going to have any issues with it particularly, but it might just take, you know, some time to get used to it. Like it's going to be that weird accommodation period. Another thing that I didn't really like, but I also wasn't really bothered by was the RGB on the keyboard. And you know, guys, I don't really care about rainbow grade barf, but if you're someone who really cares about it, I don't think that you're going to be that impressed by what this laptop has to offer. Like you do get RGB right over here, but it's not individually addressable and the keys also don't get really bright. So if you're someone who really cares about a rainbow grade bar for you really need it whenever you're typing at night or for whatever use case if you want to throw a party then I would highly recommend you look at something from Asus or MSI and you're probably going to see that Brandon from Gizmo Sliptech has a video talking about it. And yeah what else can I say if you also want uh, more out of your a laptop in general, you're most likely going to have to pay uh, a premium for it. And that includes for the keyboard and the screen and all of that stuff. And know that XMG also offers that. And I think that's enough talking about the keyboard because I would really like to um, use my voice right now to talk about the speakers, which haven't really been all of the loudest that you are going to hear on a laptop, but they have just been fine, you know, like you match that with little to no bass and um, all of the distortion that you're going to be hearing at max volume and you're going to get yourself a recipe for a mediocre sound experience. Still, if you're going to be someone like me who most of the time when using a laptop, you are going to um, either be using a pair of headphones, that's going to be fine. But if you happen to use your um, speakers for the, you know, the casual meeting that you're doing or watching some YouTube videos, I would like to point out that they're going to be just fine. Another thing that is really cool on this laptop is that you get an EQ, which is obviously going to let you improve or tweak the sound at least. So um, that's exactly how I tested um, most of this stuff. Um, and I have to say that it didn't really bother me whenever listening to chill beats and doing some um, like back and forth with some friends and asking them like, hey, what did you think of the microphone and the webcam? And I guess right now is the perfect time to also check the webcam quality, the 
microphone quality and also have a look or have a listen to how the speakers sound. So let's get into all of that. Okay, so a bit of a change of scenery here and that's because quite a few days have passed since I first unboxed this laptop and now you can also get an idea of how the webcam looks like, how the microphone sounds like and now I'm also going to start typing on the keyboard and from the testing that I've done I didn't really think that it was able to pick whenever I was typing on the keys. I'm also going to be turning fan boost on just to give an idea of how loud things are going to get whenever you're going to be doing something else that is going to require it in the background. So I think that the webcam quality is not anything that is going to blow you out of the water, but obviously it's going to be fine assuming that you're going to have some proper lighting in your room for all of your Teams calls, uh, Zoom calls and everything else. But obviously if you're going to want to be the next Twitch streamer, I suppose that you guys are going to need a better webcam like I have over there and also a good pair of headphones with a microphone or a standalone one. So let me know what you think in the comments. And here are the results coming out of latency mode, something which I expected to see based on the prior conclusions that I've drawn. And I can tell you that the max audio levels peaked at 73 decibels, but most of the time they will be sitting in the range of 60 to 65 decibels if you're going to really crank those speakers. But if you're going to take a more reasonable approach like I've done, you're most likely going to hear anywhere between 45 to 50 decibels, which should still be plenty enough for if a room like I have right here, which is really small. But now let's also talk about the port selection on this laptop and with regards to that I can tell you that on the right hand side you're getting two USB 3.2 ports and an SD card reader which was able to import all of the files from my SD card at 94 megabytes per second and I obviously guess that that could have gone higher but I sadly don't have any better SD cards. On the left side, you're getting a USB 2.0 port for devices which won't require the highest bandwidth or that will work best with that one and separate ports for your headphones and microphone. And if you're someone who's planning to use um, this laptop at a company or a trade show, whenever you'll be able to go to those, uh, you should know that you're also getting a Kensington lock right here, but of course you're going to have to provide yourself a Kensington cable or whatever it is called. And turning to the back of this laptop, you're going to see that first you're going to get access to the port right here, which is really nice to have on the back as compared to the side like we've seen on some laptops. I really enjoy having this one. And you are also going to see that you're getting access to a uh, Ethernet port, which is really nice to have, especially if you want to get uh, the maximum speeds. But know that you're also going to be able to make good use out of the um, Wi-Fi card on this uh, system. And the next thing that you're going to see is going to be the HDMI 2.1 port, which is really nice to have. One thing, of course, obviously. And another one is that you're going to be able to get 4K 120 Hertz in the games, which will be able to run at that resolution and the refresh rate. And also on the barely a dozen monitors with HDMI 2.1 support, because so far there are not a lot of them who, which currently support it. But of course, if you would like to hook this up to a TV that supports it, well, that's going to be all fine and dandy. But with all of the jokes aside, I would also like to point out that the HDMI connects directly to the NVIDIA GPU, which is really nice to have. And the same can be said about the Type-C connector, which also connects directly to it, which means that if you are a VR player, you're going to be able to put your uh, VR headset and connect it to the laptop and get a really good experience out of it. And if you are somewhat of a Quest user like myself, then I would highly recommend you use virtual desktop and make use of the um, Wi-Fi on this 
a laptop and of course the Wi-Fi that you have at your home and hopefully you're going to have some better speed than what I have right here because I'm still using uh, dial-up right here. And I don't see a point in covering how well the vents perform now that you've seen uh, the results where I was talking about the CPU and the GPU, but I can assure you that uh, these fans are capable of pushing some serious air at max speeds and will also ensure that your components won't cook themselves. Of course, this is assuming that you're not going to be running ADA64 and Apex Legends at the same time, or that you're not going to be doing any rendering and cryptocurrency mining at the same time. And if you are going to do that, then uh, please stop, get some help. And now that you've heard how loud the fans can get, I can tell you that if you're going to be using a good pair of headphones, you're not really going to have any issues with it. And you're also most likely not going to have any issues getting to the insides of this laptop because you just have to take off some screws and poof, you're in. And then you're obviously going to be greeted by the Puny 64 watt hour battery, two sticks of eight gigabytes of DDR4 RAM at 3200 megahertz, not sorted by the way, which means that you'll be able to upgrade it if you wish so, the Wi-Fi card and the heat pipes and the fans to cool this bad boy. And again, I'd say that this is all pretty neat and accessible. And again, it's not really too um, extravagant or excessive or complicated for the average user. So I'm really happy to see that XMG have taken this approach. Of course, this is a Tongfang Clavo chassis and you're going to be able to see it on some other laptops as well. But I really had to mention how easy it is to get into or the to the insides of this laptop. And also it's really easy to use control center, which is what I'd like to cover next. Now in the control center, you're going to be able to make a lot of changes and we're going to go through each one of those tabs together, starting with the general settings tab, where you'll be able to turn things on and off like the Windows key, the Nvidia Optimus, the touchpad, the FN keys, and pretty much everything else you'd possibly want to make changes to. Some of those things can also be turned off with key presses or taps, just like how the touchpad can be turned off with a double tap on the top left corner. However, I would like to mention here that using the FN keys on this laptop has been a problem for me since I didn't have the latest BIOS version, which the guys at XMG told me that they will be updating in a week or two, and that is going to make the FN keys work as intended because right now when I'm using the FN plus uh, F3 key uh, instead of uh, having my volume go higher I believe that one actually turns off the touchpad. In the performance tab you can tweak your profiles when plugged in, set wattages, fan curves and play around with different settings. In the battery tab, you can see how much battery and time you've got left. You can also tweak how your battery charges, which is really cool if you'd like to preserve its charges over time. And in the display area, you can tweak and set color profiles, brightness and contrast, and you can also calibrate in there if you have the necessary tools for it. And lastly, in the device info, you'll get all the information you'll possibly want about your components, sensor data, and you'll actually be able to change the language. And that's about everything I was able to find in version 3.9.6 of the control center. But of course, if there are going to be any changes that I might spot by the time I have to give this laptop back to XMG, you're going to see all those things in the description of this video. Now, another thing to consider is that this laptop comes in at 2.56 kilograms without the charger and around 3.4 kilograms with it. So it will be quite a hefty boy in your backpack, but you know how it is. With great power comes great responsibility and that includes carrying all of the weight on your shoulders or just about every noob in all of the competitive games that you will be playing. They also say that size doesn't matter, but of course this laptop is both big and girthy, and by that I obviously mean quite a chungus, with a size of 396 by 260 millimeters and a thickness of 30 millimeters, this is not a small popper. Still, I don't consider that a problem for a battle station. Now, I've mainly tested this laptop for gaming and productivity, but I've also had the time to use it more or less as a secondary device on a regular basis, just to see if I'd use it myself. So here are my thoughts on that. 
For basic tasks, it doesn't get too loud or too hot, and I've only noticed anywhere between 27 to 33 decibels when using it for the usual web browsing and working on scripts, and that can be even quieter uh, whenever you're going to tweak the um, fan curve in the control center, and of course, it can also be quiet in gaming. If you're going to prefer to play more competitive titles and you're going to activate uh, NVIDIA's Whisper mode in combination with the balance modes that this laptop has to offer, then you're going to get yourself uh, still a playable experience with the fans set to very low RPM. Outdoor use is also not one of its strong suits, and I don't mean that only because of its poor battery life, because I had an outlet next to me, so that wasn't an issue, but I've had the chance to use this one on two separate sunny days, and whilst it wasn't outright horrible, you could tell that with its 300 nits of peak brightness, you're better off going out on with it on darker and gloomier days rather than those sunny days that I have enjoyed in my area. The webcam and the microphone were both fine for casual calls, but if you're planning to look better than on an old Nokia phone and have clearer sound, then I will recommend that you guys are going to get yourself some standalone devices for that. And I guess there could also be some other things to cover in this one. And speaking of cover things, I would have liked this webcam to have a cover for it, but I guess uh, the duct tape is also going to work just fine. So now that we have talked about all of those things. Let's also talk about pricing and availability. This laptop should be available later this year, but I don't really have any actual dates to tell you just yet. And your best bet is to go into the comment section or the description of this video where I will have more information from XMG, or better yet, check out their subreddit where they are going to be posting constant updates about availability and everything else that they have planned for you guys. I would also like to point out that availability for any of the components coming from AMD or Nvidia hasn't been all that great despite being March 2021 when I'm recording this video, so you're going to most likely have to wait a little longer before you're going to be able to buy any of the laptops from any laptop company, to be fair, and also looking at how the uh, GPU and CPU market space is going on right now. The prices have gone up, people are mining on those things, and the whole situation is really crazy and I'm going to have some videos about that right here if you are interested in checking out. But another thing to look at is going to be uh, the price of this thing. So this one is going to start at uh, 1,599 euros with this exact configuration, which in the grand scheme of things is okay, I guess, for this laptop. I haven't really been able to tell what other laptops are coming out. I know that HP is going to have their Omen 15 and Lenovo will be bringing their Legion 5, but I'm not really sure how much these laptops are going to cost in your specific area, and I'm also not sure how well they're going to perform, but by the time this video is out, you're probably going to be able to watch your reviews for those things as well, and you'll be able to make yourself, uh, well, you're going to be able to watch them and make an informed purchase decision. So that's pretty much all I can say about uh, this thing, and um, mainly that if you are someone who really likes to play with knobs and make uh, all kinds of changes to your laptops, then this laptop from XMG might actually be for you. And... If there are going to be any other things, I might actually be putting them at the end of this video. Maybe something else to cover right now would be that this is most likely going to be a better value than the other laptops that XMG has been selling um, at the time that I was recording, that I have been recording this video on Amazon, where I've seen that they had some laptops in the same uh, ballpark, so 1500, 1600 euros with RTX 20 series GPUs. Probably get this one if you can, otherwise just wait a little bit. Also, do your due diligence and look at uh, some other laptops whilst you're at it because maybe this laptop is not going to be the perfect one for you. So if you are interested in getting um, more of an idea of what you can get in this ballpark and you want to see reviews for all of the laptops, then check out another playlist that I will be linking over here. And yeah, I hopefully think that I was able to deliver you uh, guys a lot of information with regards to this uh, laptop. So thanks again for watching and especially a big thank you to everyone who was able to watch this entire video and not get, and not get uh, horribly bored. And also a big shout out to XMG for trusting me with this uh, review and all of the things that I have said over here. And if you guys have enjoyed this video, then make sure to give it a like, get subscribed, and also if you'd like 
like to watch some other videos, I'm going to have some linked over here, unless I'm going to do an extra outro for this video, because I might just do, you know, you never know how many other things you're going to be able to test on a laptop like this one, or any bloopers and stuff like that, and I should probably get to sleep because it's really late and I'm tired. Either way, thanks a ton for watching yet again. I'll see you guys in the next one, hopefully. Bye-bye. <laughs>